Hey yo, welcome to another episode of Off the Beaten Path, your new favorite podcast. And today we have Notel. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. So stoked that uh, you guys had me on here. Hell yeah. Thanks for coming on. Uh, definitely appreciate your time because it is valuable. Um, let's kind of start from the beginning. What was uh, playing in the household growing up? Um, my mom is not the musical one. My dad is definitely a little more musically inclined uh he definitely he kind of played the classics you know the eagles the beach boys that kind of stuff but i think my favorite group that he played and the thing that i still kind of keep going back to is the talking heads i just love the talking heads they're just weird just totally <laughs> weird and kind of did their own thing and i think that uh even now as an adult looking back i definitely think that their ability to push the boundaries made me more inclined and more interested in doing the same thing so yeah, and I was I was really interested, you know, in your answer because your music is out there, you know, yeah. and it's it's really different. Yeah. So I was like, what what was she listening to growing up, and also what's uh what would you say some of your inspirations are now currently? Um, people always expect my answer to this question to be somewhat like another musical artist, but I am so heavily influenced by other people's writing whether that's in a book or whether that's in a poem or on tv shows or movies anything like that um i have an english degree and i absolutely love just like the written word and any type of creative writing so it's less musical influences and more kind of things like folklore and scary stories and stuff like that i, I just find other people's writing really inspiring and one phrase can kind of like trip something in my brain and all of a sudden i'm writing a whole nother song from it so wow uh yeah that's that's i love that one you said you're an english major and i suck at english <laughs> <laughs> Nate, nate's interesting when he speaks sometimes <laughs> Yeah, no, honestly, I, I say that I got a four year degree in like making shit up because I mean, it's like I there's no way that everyone could read the amount of literature that you had to consume in between classes. So oh, there was yeah. a lot of spark notes, a lot of skimming pages and a lot of just like making stuff up and just having a point and knowing how to drive that home and convince other people that you the point was valid. That's basically all I did. But so don't worry, I still fumble over my words, too. I'm not exactly. <laughs> A poet laureate, quite yet. But. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, do you do a lot of reading, like books and stuff? Yeah, I do. My Kindle. I was just talking to someone about that today. My Kindle is like one of my favorite things. I love a good paperback, love a good yeah. hardcover, but the Kindle is just like, it's so convenient. I love it. Yeah. Um, something I love is uh, I I cannot say his name right, Sudi and Stevens or whatever, but yeah. um, yeah. so that song name or, or, or that song itself, you have a lot of metaphors to explain things, but one of my favorite ones in the song is, you know, I don't have to be the hero like Samwine. Yeah. Because I just got into Lord of the Rings probably one or two years ago and read the yeah. books and was like, when I heard that line, I'm like, yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's like every bibliophile and every nerd's like favorite song because there's so many references in there, especially that are like literary ones. But the Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones is a Bible reference, Scarlet Letter reference. So, so it definitely I let my kind of like nerdy literature freak flag fly in that song. But I'm so glad you like that line. <laughs> that was one of those lines when I wrote it that I, I didn't really think much about it but i've had so many people reference that line in particular and how much it resonated with them and it, it makes me really really happy when people take the time to listen to the lyrics right I do think that's kind of like an undervalued aspect of the songwriting now so thank you for saying that that really does mean a lot so and see i had actually written down the line after that uh where you said uh but the end of every story gives a glory to a friend and i was like whoa that like hits <laughs> me right in the chest i like that yeah it was that whole samwise passage everyone was like i love lord of the rings man and i'm like yeah <laughs> so, and was yeah. there any bit of a uh, no tell in that line or was it um just purely uh the story of lord of the rings that's a good question um i think yes and no I definitely prefer to be kind of behind the scenes. Being an artist is not a natural uh, kind of inclination of mine. If you guys ever have the chance to come out and see one of my live shows, I mean, I'm like covered in lights and fog. I, I don't really like being in the spotlight all that much. So the first kind of 
half of my career, I was a songwriter for other people and I had other people singing the songs and I still do a lot of that. But now my artist solo project is kind of taking more of the forefront. So I'm having to get used to that. But there there is a lot of me that has to, I guess, quote, give the glory to the friend, but none of it feels um like I don't want to I enjoy that part of the writing but there in that aspect there is a lot of taking the back seat and letting somebody else kind of get the attention and the credit for work that you do behind the scenes but that's just part of being a songwriter so and with oh go on Bob no go ahead I like your questions better <laughs> <laughs> that's true friendship right there that's real <laughs> love it I don't even know what that means but I'll take the credit for it <laughs> So one thing I've never done, I've recorded uh, from uh, being in bands before, but I've yeah. never had an actual producer where they go in and say, hey, I'm going to direct the process of this song. So w with that, being a songwriter and somebody who is a, a poet more naturally, being an artist in the recording studio where the producer does uh, get into the weeds of it with you, what does mm -hmm. that feel like to say, let me give them some of the reins on what's my project, but I want to see where they take it? Yeah, I think um, that's another great question. You guys are killing it. But the I think the dynamic and the relationship between artist and producer is something that is it's hard to kind of explain outside of that context. It does take a lot of trust. Like you were saying, my producer is his name is Jesse Brock. He is like one of my closest friends. We've been friends for years. Um, I had another producer in the past, but it didn't pan out, which is great because then I ended up kind of leaning on my friend, Jesse. He's always, he's been my friend far. He was my friend before he was my producer, but I do think that there is, you have to have some type of connection, which is not romantic in any sense. It's, and it's not even platonic. It's just kind of like a general creative understanding and on the same wavelength. So I think between Jesse and I in particular, there is, um, a sense that he can, if I were to totally sit back and not do anything, he'd probably hit the nail on the head 80% of the time. Um, and then the other 20% is just my ideas and us kind of collaborating on them. So it is kind of a unique connection when you find a producer that gets you and it makes it very difficult to move on to another producer, even if that other producer might push you in new ways. It's, it's hard to find someone that understands you creatively. So when you do, you really, are fighting against moving on from it. So, but most people don't even think about that. So that's, that's cool of you guys to talk about it. Yeah, definitely. And um, like what Jesse, when you make a musical shift, uh, does he follow and catch up pretty quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. And he, it's great because like, I can say I have one idea and we'll, we'll make references to them and call them like 1.0 ideas, knowing that I'm presenting this, but it could definitely be elevated. We could definitely push it further. So I'll say, here's my 1.0 idea for the chorus drum pattern. And he'll be like, that's great. How about we take it and change this kind of thing? And I'm like, that's really cool. How about we edit this thing? And it's kind of like a constant collaborative feedback call and response kind of thing. But he definitely is very, talented at what he does and he's able to kind of pick out where I'm going, whether I know I'm going there or not. So So with the no tell, is it basically just you and Jesse working on it, working on yeah. songs together? Yeah. So it's, so, it's almost like a Billy and a Phineas. Type yeah, of yeah, yeah, definitely. It's that kind of dynamic. I know that there I'm not the only artist who defaults to the same producer, but I think because I and so and I'm so interested in the production aspect of stuff. I'm not a particularly gifted engineer, but in terms of writing all of the all of the instrumentation from the bass line to the drum parts to the vocal throws to the vocal editing, I'm I'm so heavily involved in that process that someone like Jesse, it's advantageous for me to kind of stick with someone like him because he doesn't have a massive ego that if I want to kind of redirect him, he's not going, no, this is how I want to do it. I'm going to do it this way kind of thing. So mm. yeah, it, um, when it comes to the lyrics and the melodies though, those are 99.9% .9 of the time, all me. Um, I just prefer to work like that. I think it's, um, I'm less concerned about other people's opinions. If I sit down and I kind of write it all as much as I can by myself and Jesse will give me feedback if I need it. But for the most part, I try and write all of them alone. It feels more like a diary entry that way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, like you can tell your uh, songs are also deeply personal, like you're speaking about, um, like experiences you've, that you've had in the past. Yeah, yeah, I try to. It's when you write for other people, which I do pretty frequently, you don't have as much of an opportunity to tell your own story, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason why I wanted to start my own solo project is that I was, I got a little frustrated and I felt slightly uninspired by writing other people's stories all the time. I thoroughly enjoy it, but all the time it just wasn't working for me. I felt a little, you know, stifled creatively. So it is, it is a sense of like relief and it is some type of cathartic release when you can write a song and then you give it life in the production, you get to perform it live and you, you see people like you two, you know, relating to the lyrics. It, it, it makes it super, I mean, I don't even know what word I'm looking for, but enjoyable, rewarding, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, something, something I'm curious about is in Diet Change. Mm -hmm. um, at the very end of it, you know, you're like, I hope they like it because mm. I was sad. <laughs> oh, God, I, lo I love that part too. I'm so happy you guys like that. Yeah, I was like real sad. <laughs> I was going through some serious shit there. Um which a lot of my songs around that, that I wrote around that era were around about the same relationship, um, which thankfully is in my past in all of the best ways possible. But that song, especially because it was so different sonically from the other things that I had released and what people had kind of decided was my brand and come to expect from me, releasing a song like that, that was so like it wasn't quite as dark it was just sad and it felt more orchestral than it felt heavy mm -hmm. um so i was a, i was very vulnerable when releasing that because i was i genuinely was like this is exactly how i felt in that moment and i really hope that people respond to it and they don't go well, this doesn't have a wubby bass line like right. you know yeah, that they actually yeah. liked it even though it was different so yeah yeah and you spoke uh, in um, a previous interview that that was the first song where you wrote about your feelings while you're presently working through them. Yeah. What about um, other songs? How far past um, the experience do you typically write about the, uh, the experience? Um, I think it it changes which, with each song, but for the most part, I kind of have to, uh, like I said in, in that interview, in relation to diet change, like it's almost impossible for me to sit down and work through a feeling while writing about it because I always feel like I never do it justice in a sense. And it's not till it's kind of like processed and packed up and put in my emotional closet that I can kind of go back and sort through it all and look through all of the metaphorical pictures and letters and ticket stubs and whatever and really kind of understand exactly what happened and exactly what I need to say in order to encapsulate like that feeling or that experience. But I mean, most of the time it's like a couple months <laughs> of like licking my wounds and crying, you know, in the bathtub for me to be able to go back and truly unpack it. It, it takes a minute, but. <laughs> hey, well, that's not pretty that's close to the experience though. Yeah, yeah, I think so. it's, I also feel like, uh, I have to, if I'm writing about something I've gone through, I have to kind of like hyper focus on specific moments within that experience. So say with this relationship that Diet Change is about and a couple other songs are about, if I were to talk about the experience overall, I would get like very, very overwhelmed and I'd be wildly incapable of expressing that. But if I focus on one conversation or one aspect of what I was feeling or one situation that I was in with this person, it makes it a little easier to kind of compartmentalize and shift through it, which is why I end up writing like six songs about it. Cause you think it'd be like one and done, but I'm like, uh, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. That shit is a whole album. <laughs> so yeah. it, it kept on coming. I'm like, I think this is the same relationship. Holy shit. She was yeah, it was stuff. rough. It was a rough one. That's for sure. But we're good now. We're good now. And that's all that matters. And one thing I've been curious about with artists yeah. in general, and Nate and I've talked about this a lot uh, through the years, is when you write so personal, it's more of a somber, melancholic feeling, but now you're months past it, years past it, and you have to perform that on stage for an audience that still wants to hear it. 
mm-hmm. but you're in a happy place now. How does that feel revisiting that wound, even though it's not presently wounding you in your day to day? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, there are certain songs that are harder to perform than others. Um, for one and two, I think I write melancholy songs naturally because when I close my, when I was start, first starting this project, when I would close my eyes and I'd think about, okay, what kind of songs do I want to sing live? Like, I don't want to be jumping around stage and like dancing with like, you know, glitter guns and like background dancers. Like, I don't think that's my vibe. So I end up kind of writing songs that I feel comfortable physically performing, even without the like emotional aspect mm. of it. So I end up writing songs that like don't require me to have to like boogie. You know what I mean? Like they're not like yeah. boogie songs. They're kind of songs that like it's a you can have a very laid back performance and it's well suited for my personality and my lack of interest in the spotlight. So that's probably one half of why they're all sad and why I perform them the way I do. But I think to answer your question kind of more thoroughly, uh, it is not easy, but uh, it is kind of nice to honor the piece of me that wrote those songs from that dark kind of melancholy upset place every time I get up on stage. It is a piece of me, it is a diary entry, and even though it does feel like reopening a wound, it's in a way kind of like um, emotional cutting and it feels kind of nice to acknowledge that that's what I've done, but not who I am. That that was at, you know, at minimum or maximum a three and a half minute kind of mm-hmm. way to honor that piece of me. And then it's done. It's like taking the emotional garbage out. You do it, put it in the bag and you send it out. And you can right. go back there and you can cry and you can mourn and then you come right back to your regular life. It gets it out of you rather than kind of it eating you from the inside out. And I'm sure it also helps other people, you know, yeah. at, your, at your shows. Like They're like, hey, wait, no, don't, don't take the garbage out. Like, give it to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, carry yeah. the emotional baggage. Like, it's helping me too. You know, yeah, so. it is that's, nice to see that for sure. And that's beautiful. But at the same time, it kind of sucks because we love a sad song. We love a sad artist. We love an artist that's depressed because sometimes that's when the best music comes out. It's because it's sure. raw emotion and we're able to relate with it. But soon, like, if that artist gets happy on us and they start making super happy music, it's like, why are they happy? Fuck oh, this God, music. I know that. <laughs> yeah. I'm still depressed. I need their help. Exactly. I know. God, I know. And especially now, I, like, I'm in a very happy, healthy, monogamous relationship. And I sit down to write a song and I'm like, well, shit, what am I going to write? I can't write about this guy. He's like, great. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. like, yeah, I don't think anybody wants like a macaroni and cheese piano jingle from me about how happy I am. I'm like, I don't think that's why people are at my show. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. But it is nice to know that other people connect to the sadness. And it does feel nice that like I can be very, very real and very, very raw and know that there are other people out in the world that feel the same thing and almost might need to hear a song like that. Exactly what you're saying. It's mm-hmm. I think it's like group therapy, you know, Yeah, it is. It is because they, they can leave home. You know, they might have went to the show with all this baggage on them. And then after they leave, they're like, man, I can breathe a little bit. Like the next day may suck, but yeah. for that moment, you give them something that they didn't have when they went in. So yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I really, I really hope that that's how people feel. That would be that's a very wonderful way to look at it, and that would be make everything worthwhile for sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm sure you've been to a show or a concert or whatever, and you felt the same way, like maybe soon as you leave you feel bad again but in that moment you felt so free like yes yeah i don't have to think about anything yeah there's a sense too of like maybe this is just for creatives or maybe this is for everyone i I don't know but um a sense of kind of like piggybacking off of their inspiration that gives you your your own inspiration Mm -hmm. kind of thing it's like the energy that they're giving off of the stage however you want to interpret it whether it's like okay, great, they're just as messed up as I am, or like, okay, great, they're really killing it. And now I feel wildly inspired to go back to my creativity and really create something that would be 
that someone would have the same response to. So, right. And that could go with anything, you know, it could go to someone who has never done music before, doesn't know how to do music, but they're an author and they go and see one of their favorite bands and they're like, yeah, I'm going home and fucking writing. I'm finishing this book I've been working on. Exactly. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you there. And your your live shows like uh, it, it was kind of dark because, you know, you, you said like the lights and shit, but. What's that? Um, for, you know, excuse my ignorance, but what's that drum thing that you? Oh playing? yeah, it's it's called a Roland SPD pad. It's just like a like a drum trigger pad. So each pad is kind of assigned to a specific drum sample that we use in one of our songs or whatever track, and then just kind of you just play it just like you would a drum kit, except for each pad triggers a different sample. So. Mm. And honestly, <laughs> I asked for that for Christmas and I made Jesse, my producer, teach me how to do it because he plays <laughs> live with me and he helps me do all my live show stuff too. He's like a serious jack of all trades. But I was like, dude, I'm just standing there like dancing around. Like I need yeah. something to do. Mm. I look lame as hell. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got an SPD pad and a couple of drumsticks. And I, I mean, I cannot play the drums, but I can play those patterns well enough to make people think that I can play the drums. And right. that's all I need. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, all yeah. that matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I hope nobody listens to that thinks I'm like a poser now, but I mean, I definitely am. So <laughs> check it out. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, And uh, also something about your live show is it looks like you're just having like it looks like it's an experience like it's so fun and you look so free up there what's something else that makes you feel that free like rather mm -hmm. it's hiking reading whatever it is where you just don't have to worry about anything. Don't have to, i would say driving i love to get in my car and drive at night mm -hmm. like if i have uh, like obviously i mean if anybody hasn't gotten COVID at this point they're like in the matrix just dodging everything but <laughs> when I had COVID and I obviously couldn't leave my house, it put me in such a weird place mentally because I felt so wildly unproductive. And as someone who generates their own income, being unproductive made me feel like I had no value, which is something I'm working on in therapy, but you know, we don't climb mountains overnight. But one of the things that was really helpful for me is getting just getting in my car and driving. I have, I wrote Sufjan Stevens entirely in the car. I love, it just, it feels like when half my brain is occupied doing something that I can do on autopilot, the other half of me feels free and uninhibited. And I don't have the self editing habits that I normally do. So that and in the shower, those two places yeah. I'm like, oh, I just love it. I feel very like at peace and very, like uh free to create so what about Something you guys like, uh fuck um <laughs> I, <laughs> you're like i didn't prepare an answer i just prepared uh, the question <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> for me um i guess uh one being on stage you know because i uh i say i play in the band but i think we're dead but anyways being on stage that's just nothing matches it and also, I played ping pong for a good bit of my life for like 10 years, but actually like training for it and now playing tournaments and shit like that. Like, that's there's, cool. <laughs> there's like table tennis. It's I don't know. Like I can go in there stressed as fuck. But as soon as I start playing, like I walk up, I'll literally walk to the gym and like see all the tables set up and everyone playing. I'm like, I'm here. And I don't think about anything else until I leave. But most times I leave super fucking happy. Wait, that's very cool. I have never met anybody that is gifted with table tennis. I wouldn't say gifted, but I'm learning. <laughs> uh, hey, no, no, no. I'm sure you're. I'm sure you're wildly good at it. Because I think anybody who's who's that passionate about something has to have some type of like innate talent. You know, that's yeah. super cool. Yeah, and yeah, that's definitely a, a place where it's like nothing else exists no worries no nothing no bills nothing you and the paddle exactly 100 percent. that is so cool yeah and i can't wait to see him play again because he called me a few months ago 
And I was like, hey, bro, just sign up for my first table tennis tournament. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, we played ping pong growing up, whatever. Yeah. And he's like, I have a coach. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I was like, there's an underground league where there's, like, tournaments and coaches? Like, how does no one know about this? He's like, yeah, bro, when I commit, oh. I commit. I'm full send on the table tennis. Right? Oh, I love yeah. it. That's okay. so what about cool. you? What about yeah, you, Bobby? Oh, mine's easy. Um, being deep in the woods, backpacking with um, uh, one of my best friends. Yeah. Uh, when I was in uh, North Georgia, like we did day hikes and uh, some overnights, like on a fairly regular basis. But since yeah. I moved uh, out here to Charleston, we uh meet up for about four to five days once a year, and just do like a big trip. And I always joke around and say, unless somebody's about to die, that trip's going to happen because it's just yeah. a good it's a good reset. Um, we like super remote, so we don't hear like anything that's man-made and just yeah. being in, in nature with, I used to say the quiet of nature, but nature's actually really loud. Yeah. It's um, not quiet at all, but, but I understand what you mean. Yeah. But it's a, it's a different sort of, um, uh, loudness Noise. that yeah. almost quiets like your inside, whereas okay. like traffic and like business and work, like it almost like irritates your insides a little bit cause it's so noisy. Yeah. I get that. Is this the same friend that you go with or just any close friend? Yep. Same friend. Um, every, usually every September, October, we go out there for about four or five days. Have you guys I been did. taking like the same photo that you can like time lapse it? Like, do you do anything to kind of memorialize these trips? I, it's super cool. Yeah. We actually have a Google drive where um, we don't share it, but it's just personal for us too. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. One of these days you're going to have to swap photos. Oh, we do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he's su he's super organized. And he's like, hey, man, I need your photos, like, stat. <laughs> oh, my God. I love having friends yeah. like that. I need that because I'm just like, he's like, hey, you want to plan a trip this year? I'm like, you you don't want that from me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're like, I feel like it's going to go better if you do it. <laughs> right. Kind of like Nate was like, I like your questions. I'm like, I like your planning. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I get that. Oh, but yeah. I yeah. Are you a, are you a Gemini? I am a Gemini. Okay, because when you're talking about driving, I was like, Nate's really into that. Then you're like, I wrote Sufjan Stevens in the car. I'm like, she says, oh, oh so trouble Gemini in that song. I wonder if they're both Geminis. We're yeah. both Geminis. Hell Gemini yeah. Best. I was just talking to, I have like a part-time job at a barbecue restaurant, which is hilarious only because I'm a, like, I don't eat meat. So ah. that's like a hilarious place to work. Um, but when my coworkers asked me, he was like, are you a Gemini? I said, yeah. And he was like, I love Gemini's man. I was like, Gemini's are the best. We're totally underrated and people have a bad impression of us, but we're, we're cool. We're the best one for sure. Yeah. Okay. Cause they say like, oh, y'all got two sides. Like when that other side comes out, I say, well, the other side's beautiful motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, why do I have to be like super happy and also like some like crazy backstabbing bitch? Like why yeah. can't I just be like yeah. happy and sad? Like why? And I kind of, it's funny that you guys mentioned that and it makes sense as to why I put it in a song because whenever I do interviews or people talk to me after shows, they're like, man, your stuff is so dark and it sounds like you hate your dad. And I'm like, my dad's actually great. I'm actually like a super happy person. So that kind of duplicity always throws people off mm. when they hear this like super dark stuff and the branding is really dark and the genre is called nightmare pop. And then I'm like, hey guys, what's up? Like. Talk to me about ping pong, you know, they, <laughs> right. they weren't expecting it. They kind of, so I think in that aspect, my Gemini ness definitely comes out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, speaking of, you know, being dark and gloom, you covered on, um, oh, what is it? What is it? Uh, uh, Hedgeboro. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And, you know, that's, um, I, I like the cover of it because theirs is like, oh, woo, yeah. and then you're like, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was so good. What made you want yeah. um, to pick that one to cover? Um, that one I actually did, the dark cover songs I've done, I did with um, not Jesse, I did with another producer named John the Dropout. He's super talented too, he's local. Um, and those are just like very fun, kind of lighthearted sessions. And since they're not original songs, there was less pressure. Um, but I don't know, we were stuck on trying to figure out what dark cover song to do. Um, and we just kind of, one day we were supposed to work on a song and we, we were trying, I think you are my sunshine. We were trying that in like a minor instead of C and we couldn't get it to work. So instead we were like, 
screw it. We're just going to go to Publix and get some beer and just like hang out and heads will roll. But the yeah, yeah, yeah's came on and we were like, that's it. That's a song. <laughs> there wasn't much thought that went into it other than being like, that song's dope. Like we could definitely make that super cool. And I think it turned out super unique and I was not expecting it to be uh, like people really like it I, yeah. I kind of just thought it was going to be like another filler release just to kind of keep the content coming people really responded to it so I was stoked about that and so was he yeah it definitely turned out great and um also something that you don't promote too much on your Instagram is your work that you do with Luma like y'all have done Lexus commercial you write for DJs so yeah. I'm just going to give the floor to you. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> let me ask this. Let me ask this. How did you meet Luma? So Luma, um, she's actually, it's funny because my two of my closest friends would be Jessie and Luma. Her real name is Brittany. Um, she sings the majority of it. We actually met in Nashville through kind of like a mutual acquaintance. He knew both of us individually and was like, you guys should meet. And then we met and we were like, yep, <laughs> I'm a girl, like 100%. So uh, we do a lot of top lining work, which is like the name for someone who has our kind of role in dance music, which is like top liners or featured vocalists. So that's we do a lot of that work together. Um, and it's it's really great because that stuff is the stuff that since I'm not singing a lot of those songs and they're all kind of like project based um, she finds more kind of connection to the songs we write in that avenue because she sings them and we're writing a lot of them from her perspective or we're writing a lot of them based on what the DJs want us to write. So I'm not as like wildly emotionally connected to that part of my job, but I, it is really, really nice to exercise that part of like a songwriting muscle, I guess. Right. We kind of like go into a session try to achieve the goal, try to match the brief, try to hit the target. And then you walk out of the room and then you're not attached to it anymore. Like mm -hmm. you have to detach from it because um, you don't have an option. Um, yeah. So again, kind of like the duplicity there between having that kind of like uh, regurgitated writing skill when you're writing for other people versus your solo project where you're heavily invested in it and every song feels like a diary it's nice to have an avenue although it's not as inspiring for me it is um it's really nice to just be able to write for writing's sake and not right. have to be so concerned that i didn't nail the expression of my own feelings that it's it's somebody else's story it's somebody else's goal it's somebody else's song that you're just right. kind of helping bring to life so yeah and what is it like having your job because uh, i would maybe you don't but like the songwriting top lining would be in my mind like more of your job in music yeah whereas uh your solo stuff no tell would be more your passion yes um, absolutely even, even yeah. though you bring a, a business mind to it what's it like having your job and your your side hustle your passion be the same field um i think it's it is good and bad um i think the good part is that it seems to be like a self-feeding machine that as you achieve more in one realm, it makes you, it gives you more clout in the other. Mm -hmm. So if someone were to kind of approach me for the work I do in dance music with DJs and with Luma, and I go, oh, you like that? I also have this whole other artist project that you might be interested in and vice versa. If someone comes to my show and they say, hey, we're really interested in these eight songs you have. I'm like, oh, you'd be thrilled to find the other 60 mm -hmm. that are have been released through other avenues. So in that way, it's, it is, uh, it provides me a lot more opportunity and you have 10 open doors rather than just five. If I was limited myself to just one lane. Um, the other part of it is that I'm trying to monetize my passions and my interests two different ways. Yeah. And it is exhausting that there is no relief from <laughs> music. As much as I love it, it is, huh. it is very exhausting to basically do one thing from a certain hour and you kind of try and shift gears and it's just another version of the same exact thing. So, yeah. you know, sometimes I wish that I was a dog walker, <laughs> you know, and I was making no. a bunch of money walking dogs and then I could yeah. come home and be like, cool, I'm just gonna like have a beer and write a song, <laughs> you know, yeah. for writing's yeah. sake. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I am very, very lucky 
to have been provided the opportunities just through my friends that believe in me and through kind of other people that have believed in me to kind of give me those really cool opportunities like the Lexus commercial that was like super cool I mean my parents were like we know what that is we know what a commercial is <laughs> I was like, finally, something to translate the dinner parties. <laughs> yeah, you you understand it now. Like, I'm yeah. not just out here putting out music. No, I'm, I'm yeah, making yeah. moves. They're like, Spotify, what's that? Like, exactly. Is that like YouTube? And you're no. like, oh, God. <laughs> so when you can say, I got a song in a commercial, they're like, woo! Yeah. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's awesome. Great. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. That, um, and, I mean, how do you find the motivation when you don't have the motivation? Um, there is a book called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. I need to read um, that. Yeah, it was given to me as a gift. And he told me, my friend Drew, who gave it to me, told me that um, I should only give it to people as gifts. I should never lend it out. That if someone ever wants to read it, that I should just buy the book for them and give it to them. That's what he did for me, which I thought was kind of a nice, like, sentimental aspect to it. Um, but he's a creative too. And there's one chapter in that book that says like, it talks about inspiration and talks about a muse. Um, and he basically says like, inspiration strikes me every morning at 9 a.m. when I sit down at my desk to write. Because that's when I sat down at my desk to write. Like, it's just, you cannot always rely on inspiration. You cannot always rely on a muse and you cannot always rely on yourself to be motivated to do it. Sometimes you just have to sit down and do it. Yeah. And whether you get a good song or whether the song is absolute total shit, at least you got a song. Right, right. You know, so I think it's like, and it's one less bad song <laughs> that you have right. in it yeah. until you get to the good song. So I think that motivation is, I think, a very kind of touchy topic for most creatives, especially if they're entrepreneurial, or entrepreneurial in any sense, because it's just you. And if you don't sit down and do it, the work that you only you have the ability to create won't get done. So like a podcast like this wouldn't exist without you guys having some type of motivation to have the conversations you're having to really deep dive into kind of the emotional aspects of artistry, regardless of what medium it is. So I think yeah. um, motivation is just really, really tough. And I struggle with it a lot. Um, and there are definitely days where I'm like, what am I doing? Am I even good at this? Do I even, does anybody even care? Am I just screaming into the empty black void kind of thing? <laughs> you know? Right. So yeah, but it's, I, I always think back to that book, like the inspiration strikes every time I sit down at my desk because I sit yeah. down at my desk every day at 9am. So I'll have to send you guys the book. Hell yes, that yeah, would be yeah. amazing. Yeah, one to Georgia and one to Charleston. It'll be great. Yes, I would accept it 100%. Awesome. I got to fix my fucking, my uh, my cable. Okay. Every time I do the smallest movement, it's fucking making noises and shit. Oh yeah, now you're good. I can't hear it. Hopefully my mic's uh, doing all right. Is it okay? Sounds beautiful. Oh yeah, I have hyper ears for this shit, so you both sound great. <laughs> okay, good, perfect. <laughs> but yeah, even the nature is noisy to him, so we got to make sure that exactly our, <laughs> sonically we're we're pleasing. Yeah, exactly. Like, we've had people on, and um, no fault of their own, like the sound just was not good that night. I'm just like, this is hard to listen to. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you guys ever go to those exercise classes where they're wearing those headpieces and they're just screaming into them, they're like, oh. all right push yourself only 15 minutes and you're like i can't it hurts my ears like keep it front like what like can you not hear it it sounds awful it's like right. if you were to sound better i might be motivated yeah exactly there is motivation again there it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely oh, oh yeah what's yeah. a uh, scene like in nashville for for your type of music because of course nashville is a musical scene especially with country yeah. but for your type of music, uh, how's it sing? Uh, it's definitely scarce, but I think that that is uh, plays to my advantage because mm -hmm. there are a handful of girls or guys or non-binary folk that are doing something in my capacity, which is like darker and heavier. So it's easier to cut through the noise when there's only five to 10 other people making the noise. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I was a country act, I'd be really really having to fight for notoriety so i think in that sense it's great um 
on the flip side, you know, double-edged sword to play devil's advocate, there are less people looking for someone like me and there are less opportunities for someone like me. But um, I think ultimately though, it's a great thing, but it's definitely growing. And the more I play live and the more I kind of invest in my artist project and then this weird kind of alternative genre I'm in, the more I see people who are appreciative of it and want to collaborate and will kind of want to expand it with me. So it's cool. I mean, Nashville's a great city. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, that was one of the fascinating things I found about you before I even uh, checked out your music was that you were a pop artist from Nashville. I was like, I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, it's actually yeah. like seriously yeah. popping off. I think the darker, creepier stuff, people are like, what? They still haven't really gotten a handle on it. But there's a bunch of really cool organizations here. Um, there's like Pop Squad, No Country for New Nashville, um, Pop Off. Like there's a lot of cool, smaller kind of um, grassroots organizations that really do a good job of showcasing kind of like local pop talent or anybody alternative anybody who's just not top 40 country they yeah. really do try to kind of showcase that so super appreciative of those people because without them people would be like who are you what's happening <laughs> right right you know? yeah that's yeah, great and you may not be able to answer this at this current time in your life but would yeah. you call nashville home or and if not is there what what's your next next move um if i yeah nashville i think is definitely home i like own my house here and it's you know like a creepy charming house from the 1930s it takes on a bunch of water in the basement when it rains so at this point um i, I love my house and i love this city so i don't see myself leaving if i did it would be because of like a job opportunity um mm -hmm. but if i could close my eyes and move anywhere i'd move to london oh why london cool. That's a creepy city. There's a lot <laughs> okay. of stuff that's happened there. <laughs> it's, um, uh, yeah. There's just so much history and there's so much that I find so inspiring. I mean, you're just like walking around the corner and there's a castle. Right. That, like, right. You know, it's like the people who were in the castle and was originally built, like you don't even know what their names are anymore. It's yeah. so old. So it's like, I love London. I think it's super cool. But Nashville for the meantime. Hell yeah. 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 And let me ask you this. You know, you talked about dark shit and your your songs are more on the darker side. But do you like like murder mysteries or anything like super fucked up and creepy? Yeah, see, I do. I get uh, the only thing I can't do is I don't know how to separate this into two different categories of like murder. But I can't do when the antagonist is somebody that like could be right next door. Like I can do poltergeist, I can do hauntings, I can do all that stuff. But like, if the guy's like a serial murderer and he's burying people under his floorboards and he looks like the guy that lives next door to me, like uh, absolutely not. It's too real. But I don't yeah. think, like, I don't think I'm messing around with Ouija boards enough that like a demon's gonna come and that's <laughs> me when I'm asleep. But I really do think Joe from down the street, yeah, you know, like he could actually Joe. kill me. So I try not to like, if it's too gory, I try not to engage with it too much because I feel like I just carry it around. And so the rest of the day, I'm like, Ugh, you know, well, but yeah, I, I was gonna I was gonna suggest a book because it is, but it is a little gory. So I don't even know if it would be something that's up your alley. But um, the book of execution from Gregory Abbott. And no. basically, it's just the different ways that people got executed in like 1736 in Nigeria. They got fed a crack of house or, what? you know, talks that's about the village. Cool. It's, it's really cool. And what I love about it, because I don't like super gory shit, but I love it because it's like, man, we have so much fucked up shit in this world, but yeah. we've made it so far. We actually got morals, you know? Like, yeah, somehow <laughs> along the way, we stopped feeding our enemies to crocodiles and yes. like, we're a whack job in Florida. Maybe those are alligators. Yeah. I don't know. But... Yeah, but still, no, they're both dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, <laughs> Yeah. 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 No, I would, I'll definitely check that out. I think um, I went to, there was some type of like museum of torture that I went to when mm. I was, I think, in over in the United Kingdom. And that was, I think, because they talked about it in such a way that was, that didn't, it kind of lacked the human element. It was right. just kind of like procedures and very medical. It didn't bother me as much, but like, you know, I, it's very hit or miss with me, but I'll definitely have to check that book out because. 
who knows? Maybe I'll get a song out of it. My mom would hate that, but I think it would be oh. kind of good. <laughs> I, I'll promise you, if, if you if you can handle it and, and, and just get through a couple chapters, like, fuck, this isn't really my type of thing, but you could definitely make a song out of one of the chapters 100%. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to take a little deep dive into it. Yeah. We'll trade, we'll trade books. I'll hey, look there at we that go. book and I'll there send you. I'll send you War of Art. Yep, I'll send, I'll send it to you 100. percent Amazing. And um, one more thing that I have is uh, the vocal sample packs you did. Yeah. Um, how, how did that come about? Yeah, so um, actually one of my longtime collaborators. His name is Elliot Berger. He's uh, over in London, which is why I, part of the reason why I like London so much is there's so much kind of like dance music there. Um, but Elliot kind of reached out to me and he has a, a relationship with a company called Black Octopus Sounds, who which is the kind of like distributor, I guess, for a more like common language for that, that vocal pack. And then it just kind of got put up on Splice, which is, I don't know how familiar you guys are, but Splice is kind of like a um, like a music sample license free library. So like if you are a producer, whether you're established or just beginners, you can kind of go on to Splice and license free download and use any of these samples in your song. So anything from a full bass line to mm. a vocal part like what I contributed or uh, like a hi hat or a drum hit or a saxophone note. I mean, it's like the library is expansive. So you can kind of just use all these samples in your songs and just do with them whatever you please and know that there are no kind of like legal ramifications for using those things. So um, for me, I did about, I think, gosh, maybe five songs, seven songs, I forget. Um, we released them and essentially kind of what happens is that I've had a bunch of DJs download these samples and produce around the songs that I've written for them or for them to use. Uh, and people will kind of send me songs all the time that have been released with my samples in it, and That's which right. is super cool. I mean, part of the deal is that they can use them license free, yeah. and I don't get any credit, and which is fine. Like that's there's a monetary value of me, like monetary value of me making the packs. So every time they're downloaded, I get some type of like revenue from that. So okay. yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like uh, Spotify in a sense that every time someone streams a song, you get paid. So for this, like every time someone downloads a sample that I contributed to the website or put through my pack, then they, I get some mailbox money. Hell yeah. yeah. And we don't have any ad revenue. So if you want to say it, we can say it, but is it fuck Spotify? <laughs> I think it's uh I think it's probably like uh Spotify and all of the people who are making decisions about my value and my work's value without my my thoughts on it all. I definitely think songwriters are undervalued and underpaid. Um I was just talking about this on my Instagram tonight that it's unfortunate that in any creative arena, whether it's like a podcast or you're a book writer, you're a screenwriter or you're a sculptor or you are a, I don't know, a drummer, like it, it, creative industries are some of the only industries that do not have a kind of gateway exam or test or a exam, uh, oh my gosh, something that qualifies you from the get-go that if you pass yeah. this exam if you pass the seven series if you pass the bar you are then qualified to receive right off the bat a certain income and that is not the case for creatives like we can be wildly talented and wildly hard working and still be wildly underpaid and have absolutely no guarantee that that will ever change and it's one of the only industries that i know of that is like that, that people say that if you just work hard, you'll reach it. Like, no, that's not yeah. the case. I don't, I can't get a degree in music and then guarantee myself a six figure <clears throat> income from graduation on. That's not how it works. I could work myself to the bone for 10 years and make $10,000 and feel like I wasted 10 years of my life. Yeah. And it's just unfortunate that so many songwriters that are talented and hardworking just didn't have the luck or they were doing something ahead of its time, or maybe they were doing something that was great that was already been done. And so nobody wanted it. It's subjective and it's dependent on the opinions of people that will never meet you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And it's a big fat bummer, that's for sure. So, right. so at Spotify, I will say though, if the Spotify overlords are listening, 
they do provide a lot of opportunity for smaller indie artists. Um, I would not have, people would not have access to my music the way that they do with Spotify. Um, they don't have, they do have a lot of uh, kind of tools that you can use that other streaming platforms don't offer. So in that sense, I'm appreciative of Spotify, but when I get the money in my mailbox, I'm wildly unappreciative of Spotify yeah. <laughs> and how little they pay us. But that, I mean, that could go all the way up to Congress. So, you know, wow. it's like David and Goliath. And one thing I'm hoping for is um, I've been noticing from doing this podcast that more and more artists are uh, doing physical merch, whether yeah. it's uh, vinyl or tapes or even CDs. Mm -hmm. And they see that their fans are responding to it. So what I'm hoping is that we made this transition from the physical medium to the streaming services where they're fucking artists with their pay. But that might become free marketing or very cheap marketing at some point. So that you can now produce and distribute your own physical copies that people are willing to pay for. That way you have no middleman. I, ho yeah. I hope it comes to that. Yeah, I, I do too. And um, I've, I have also seen a lot of like indie artists recently. I don't know what the shelf life is, but of like NFTs, people mm -hmm. kind of really taking advantage of that and using things like um, unreleased versions of their songs or stripped down demos or single artwork or album artwork or those mm -hmm. types of things and kind of finding new ways to monetize things that, you know, have decreasing value by mm -hmm. societal standards. So I think that that's, I think artists are becoming more creative and things like Twitch, Twitch streaming and mm -hmm. that type of stuff. Like they're, they're finding more and more revenue streams because, you know, you can't at some point, as much as it feels good to complain, you cannot point your fingers at everybody else forever and expect them to change when, if there's massive corporations that are lining their pockets, like they don't care about me. So yeah. it's like, I gotta care about me. So if it's with Twitch streaming and they're watching me live produce a song and they wanna donate money, great. I have not done Twitch streaming yet. I'm not cool enough, honestly, but maybe I will. Maybe. You got maybe. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's kind of how I feel about like servers, servers who always get mad at like, hey, why aren't you tip me? And you see all the memes about it, like, or you see someone vent at to work on their story, like, hey, don't come to a restaurant 30 minutes before we close and then, then leave a $2 tip on a $50 bill. And it's like, you, you got to take it into your own hands because there's a thousand jobs out there that's better yeah. than what you're doing right now. Yeah. But it sucks that you do get that $2 tip. Yeah. It's, you know, like Spotify's out there and they are helping artists out, but at the same time, they're fucking them so bad. And it's yeah. like, you got to create your own revenue, but yeah. it still sucks that they're yeah. fucking people. It really is. It's just kind of this vicious, vicious cycle where it's, it's, it feels kind of like the quote, older music industry complaining that nobody is buying CDs anymore. It's like, yeah, dude, that sucks. That sucks so bad. But also like, what yeah. else What else can you do? Like, what are we gonna go back in time? Yeah, like, We can't do that. So it's like, you kind of have to push forward as unfortunate and as, and as unfair. Like you can be waving the flag that says this is unfair and still march forward. Like you can do both things at once. Right. So I think that's kind of what I have to do and what every other indie artist has to do is say, hey, like this totally sucks and this is super unfair, but yeah. still proceed because you have like what? Because you have to. Yeah, yeah. like I'm, otherwise I'm just gonna die on the vine. So I don't really want right. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So NFTs, I guess you know. Hell yeah, fucking Bitcoin mining and all that <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, and um, uh, one <laughs> one last thing for me at least. Uh, we talked before we started recording, so you um you have an EP coming out in you said in May. Yeah, yeah. So and... I'll have um a song. My next single will probably drop um early May. Um, I think if if this is a song that it'll be, I, it'll it's called Ex Lovers. Um, and I'm super excited about that. And it's one of five or six songs that'll be on an EP that's dropping in May. Um, and as of right now, we have a date kind of solidified at the High Watt in Nashville on May 12th. 
which I'm super excited about. It's been one of my dreams to sell out that venue. So fingers mm-hmm. crossed that it happens for me this year. Because um, yeah. it's one of the the last months that that venue will be open before I think they change to a new location. And it was the first show, a first venue I ever played at. So it seems like, you know, it's only right that I, I play this EP release show there before they close down. Hell yeah. Hell and do you have a name cool. for the EP? I haven't figured that out yet. I was just hey, thinking we're about working it. on it. <laughs> yeah, it's a workshop. It's a work of progress. Yep. <laughs> but I was laying awake at last night being like, what do I want to call this EP? It seems like such an important decision. And I'm like, it what? is, but I think, uh, get up at nine in the morning and go to your desk. Hey, yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. See, I'm thinking more like Publix to get some beer at like 7.50 on a Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> and you yeah, hear the yo. song and you're like, oh yeah, I like that lyric. That's yeah. A, that's no. title. It's no. probably going to happen when I'm not looking for it, honestly. Exactly. But, that's, how yeah. that's how the best shit happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. And what do you want from your uh, 2022, whether it's personal or uh, professional or both? Um, you know what I would love is a little more routine. You know, I love a good routine. I would love to establish one that really works for me. I'm about to start living alone, which I'm really excited about. My roommate's been great, but it's time that I venture off and live by myself. And so I'm really excited to kind of understand myself a little bit more in that capacity and kind of, you know, what I like to do when I am my only company. So Have you ever excited done that for that. Uh, right when I first moved here, but that it wasn't, I wasn't living alone by choice. I was living alone because I had no friends. So <laughs> it was like, <laughs> oh God, I got no other options. It's either, you know, alone in Nashville or at home with my parents. So I chose alone in Nashville and I liked it but it was a different season of my life. And I think now that I have some roots here and I have a goal and I have things to do and friends to do them with, I'm really excited to kind of spend a lot of time on my own. My grandmother, who I was really, really close to, she passed away about a year and a couple months ago. Um, And one of the things she said before she passed away was like, make sure you spend time and you have a season of your life that you are entirely on your own, that you are only responsible for you and you are not responsible for anybody else. So that if you want to eat hot dogs and macaroni and cheese for every meal for four days straight, you can, and you have no one to answer to. And so I think when she said that, it really put the bug in my ear that that was something I wanted to make sure I did um because if i end up with somebody for the rest of my life you know living alone is a finite resource and i'm really excited for that for 2022 long-winded answer but that's my answer i love the end of it that that was so beautiful yes man um uh before i say your name one last time for my um signing off question is it no tell or no tell no tell, whatever you no want tell. to say. I've been okay, I've been, okay. Ella. Yeah, I've been called everything, but <laughs> no tell is with the preferred. <laughs> okay, we've been yeah. saying no tell. So I was, I was like, I once asked that at the beginning, I totally forgot. So I hope yeah, you've been no. saying her name right. No, you guys um, are great. Yeah, that's perfect. All right. So last question. Um, What were you doing five years ago? What was no tell doing five years ago? And Gosh. five years from now, what do you want no tell to grow into? Are you wow. are you counting down your age? Yeah, I'm like wait, I'm like what, was, was, uh, what, what year was that? Is it 22? So it was it 2017? Was five years ago? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, five years ago, I hadn't even written my first kind of like solo artist song. So I hadn't even started this kind of solo passion project yet. I was just strictly writing for DJs and for other people, which is crazy to think about because I I would have sworn on my first kid that I don't even have yet, that I would have never ever performed by myself on stage doing my own stuff. I would have sworn. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of crazy to think back on that. But then I yeah. guess five years from now, um, for personal, I just want to make sure that I'm happy and that um, I can get up every day and do something I love. And if, you know, it all shines in my favor, that'll be music. And if it isn't, that as long as I'm happy doing it, um, 
I hope the Notel project is still around, but who knows? I mean, the last two years go to show that anything can change in a matter of weeks. So fingers crossed it still exists, but if it doesn't, three fingers crossed that I'm still happy. That's the more important part. Yeah. What about you guys? Um, I'll make it quick. Five years ago, I was uh, um, going through a breakup, trying to figure shit out. Love Five it. Five years from now, with this podcast, I want to um, I just I just want to keep talking to artists like you, who you know, Bobby made this uh line up, but c- conversations with those who dare to be different, and mm. that's I just want to make sure that this is still going and gets bigger and bigger and bigger so we can give a bigger platform to those artists that come. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. And thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, been super fun, but been awesome. I don't want to, I don't want to cut off your answer. What do you, what's your answer, Bobby? Yeah. So for me, five years ago, I was uh, preparing to move out here to Charleston mm-hmm. and we're from a s- small that like, grew into a medium sized town. Yeah. Uh, all our family was there. My core friends were there or still there. <laughs> And I was about to move away for the first time. So I was like this bittersweet emotional roller coaster of I'm about to do something I've never done. Yeah. But I can't wait. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Just on the precipice of something great. Yeah. And uh, moving here was su- such a good growth move for uh, both me and my wife. Yeah. Because I remember laying down like the first week here. It's like, fuck, there's <laughs> no support system here. This yeah. is us. Yeah. And if it goes like, great, you and me. it's on our backs. <laughs> and if it doesn't, what do we do other than yeah. tuck tails and run back home? But it's been an awesome experience. I love that we moved here. Even though I do miss my friends and family, especially now during COVID, like not seeing people oh, yeah. the way I used to. And five years from now, man, I would like for my life to be more centered around creativity. Mm. Uh, Nate and I are both musicians, a uh, bass player by instrument. Um, I would love to be back in the music. Uh, at a more regular capacity, even if it's not like my job. Right. Um, I would like to do uh, more visual art and putting mm-hmm. that out. What kind of medium? Po- uh, acrylic uh, paint on canvas. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. My wife is an amazing artist. Um, even though she, she probably is. wouldn't say that, she she is so damn she good. Is. Yeah. yeah. She is. And this past summer, she started teaching me just some techniques, and it's just a good stress relief, like expression avenue for me, and I just. I enjoy doing it now. Yeah. Um, You'll have to send me. I want to see some of uh, y'all's visual art stuff. Hers and yours. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I can send you some stuff. Yeah, please do. Please do. Yeah, he's gotten good himself because she went to school for it and she's amazing. But just in the little time that he's been doing it, it's like, holy shit. (laughs) Yeah. This is awesome, dude. Quick learner. Yeah. The ADHD brain just hyper focuses on shit. True, oh, true. Yeah. 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 She'd be like, hey, I you want to do this tonight? I'm like, I have to paint. <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> like, like, no, it is painting no. time. It is 9 a.m. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I get that. Well, yeah, I'll have to, you'll have to send me some pictures of what you've been painting. And I want to also see some pictures or some videos of you playing ping pong. Hell yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Please. Definitely. Yeah, well, that'd hey. be great. Hey. Thanks so much for coming on. This has been awesome. Yeah, it's yeah. been super fun. Yeah. I had a blast. You guys are great. It was nice to have a little virtual beer with you guys. Yes, <laughs> fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm I'm no English major, but Bobby, you said me and my wife, it's my wife and I. Oh um, yes, you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Nate, I didn't even notice I didn't even notice you did that. So if anyway, yeah, I think you can take the grandma crown there for sure. <laughs> yeah, and oh, yeah. OC- Nate is OCD as fuck, and I like that on the podcast he won't like stop me from talking. But if we're on the phone, he's like Wendy and I. I'm like what? Oh my god, that's so he's like funny. Wendy and I. He's like you said Wendy, me and Wendy. I'm like God, I forgot who I was talking to. <laughs> that's the only thing that I have. Everything else I fuck up. Like all the other words or fucking. It's like I, I was learning Japanese just for a second, and uh. Bobby was like, um, I was like, man, I don't want to, you know, go to a different fucking country and fuck their shit up. And he was like, yeah, but if you hear someone that speaks Spanish and or has their first language and then they go to speak English and it's broken, you still don't understand them. Yeah. And I'm like, bro, I can't even speak English right. 
Well, you can't just... enact. Yeah, you can't enact capacity though. Yeah, well, but hey, thanks again so much for coming on. It's been beautiful for real. Yeah, I really appreciate yeah. you guys. Thank you so much. Yes, yes Bobby, if you don't mind letting these folks know what to do, stay black, motherfuckers. Don't be wet.